much coffee, tea, and any kind of uh, food. And we'd love it if all that food went tonight, so don't be shy. Help yourself. And we have to, um, there are some expenses that were incurred for tonight, and uh, we're all grassroots organizers, so um, this all comes out of our own pocket. So if uh, these two, two ladies will be going and bringing the donations out as well. And anything that comes after our expenses, we're going to be donating to the U.S. Dome and the And also we have uh, two email sign-up sheets. So if you would like to be added to the email list that, that we're going to be initializing as part of our direct actions in the future. And also that when we have future events similar to this about direct actions, We won't take it and we won't share it. So, um, I just want to thank everyone that's out there for today. That's awesome. And also, um, Eric talked already about the, the app. Already talked today about the two actions that were that happened today and uh, for the Muscogee and Muscogee territory. And I heard that the one downtown was over a thousand people march. So we just were thrilled. And then we also did a separate action in front of Jody and the Justice of Minister of Justice Jody. Uh, Wilson Abel, and we did an action out in front of her office, and there were 70 of us out there. And, uh, and, uh, we, we created a lot of noise, and we had tons of honking. Like, it was really hard even to talk because of the honking, especially the big trucks, and also the shutdowns. So we're, we're, <laughs> we felt pretty good about that, and we have a very strong message with her um, to remember her roots. And that's what we left with her. And then we said that we're there to call out the Trudeau government and the Oregon government for their uh, their inaction on climate. So we, we gave a very, very direct uh, direct message. And uh, I just want to briefly uh, say that my name is Shirley Samples, and I, I just started organizing with Extinction Rebellion. And actually, we're, we're kind of co-hosting tonight, too. And uh, I just want to say that we are planning in the middle of April to do a week long of direct actions. So anyone that's interested in being part of this, there's a sign up sheet at the back. And also help yourself to the uh, leaflets. You can put them in the sure. coffee shops or you know, or your laundromat or wherever you think that people could see them. And uh, so this is Thank, thanks, Brad Scott, from there. And then we, uh, this is sort of why this finding was just perfect tonight to have George Lake to talk on this book. Because um, cause we are going to be doing direct actions. Because this the government's not listening to our marches and our petitions and things like that. So we are, uh, and so it's pretty exciting. UK's done some really amazing things. So that's all I have to say. So we look forward to the presentation. And speaking of George Lakey's books, they are available on the back table over there through uh, Co-op Books. Thank you very much, Co-op Books, for being here tonight and for making the book available. And uh, yeah, and we're just so excited to have George with us tonight. And uh, George, uh, just a few words of introduction, is he is a retired Swarthmore College professor. Um, he's of the Quaker faith. Uh, he's done 1,500 social change workshops on five continents. Uh, he's been arrested a number of times uh, for various uh, direct action campaigns, including a civil rights sitting in 1963 and uh, his latest campaign for jobs in 2018. Um, he's, he's written 10 books and uh, this one is his latest. So uh, we're really looking forward to hearing what George has to share with us tonight. Let's give him a warm welcome. What a pleasure to be back in Canada and back in Vancouver. I see people that I know and uh, more people to meet and more people to, to greet and more people to respond to since Response seems to be the main thing that I do in my life. 
And uh, I keep trying to take the initiative, and some people say, you're a good initiative to take your George. But then I meet people like you, and I'm a nice voluntary. So what I'll do is introduce a few concepts that are relevant, I think, to this political moment. And then I'll be very eager to find out what's on your minds so that I can respond to what is most on your minds in terms of challenges that we experience as we're working for justice and for freedom, for a, a sustainable climate, for kind of economics that would really make sense and all that. Uh, my first time in Canada was actually not that long ago. It was in the early 90s. Do you remember that there was supposed to be another trade agreement made not just be in North America, but extending in the whole hemisphere? Some of you remember that? And it seems like a lot back, yeah. And, um, and there was very uh, great interest. I think a majority of Canadians polled were saying they didn't want that. And there was a campaign to try to uh, make it not happen by exposing it, by making it transparent. And so there were petitions circulated all over Canada uh, demanding that the members of parliament uh, and, the, and the government release the text of this agreement. Now, the government had pledged, along with other governments in the, in the, in the hemisphere, not to let the people know what was up. <laughs> so the government said, no, we can't release the text. We can't let you look at this thing that we're going to sign. So what a great thing to do. And so a Canadian campaign developed to make this, uh, make this transparent. And what they announced to the government after many, many people had signed this petition that said, well, if you're not going to release it, we're going to just have to go in to the appropriate ministry and, you know, rifle through the files until we find it and uh, take responsibility for for doing a kind of citizen search and seizure. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll need to get all trained up to do this, and uh, because uh, we know that it might not be the, the way the ministry usually conducts business. So we'll have to train up. So we're going to have uh, international trainers in to train people to engage in this search and seizure. So uh, they contacted me, and uh, I agreed to come in. And I happened to be uh, far into uh, Cambodia, away from internet, away from most communication, because I was doing training over there. So I get on the plane and come at the appointed time to, uh, to arrive here to do the training. What had happened in the meantime was that a member of parliament had gone through the procedure that one does to reserve a, a governmental room, a hearing room, you know, to be able to do a public activity. So he filled out the form correctly and so on, and got one of this gorgeous, gorgeous, ornate hearing room, enormous, enormous room for the training, for the civil disobedience training in defiance of the government. <laughs> and uh, that was just kept quiet. It was just a kind of bureaucratic thing for a while. And then it became exposed and the Prime Minister, your Prime Minister, did not think well of that. Uh, but since he had followed the procedure correctly, uh, what was to be done? And so there was this back and forth, it was in front pages, and then to add insult to injury, the internationally known, probably terrorist trainer, George Leahy, was to come from, to, to, to your innocent shores. And, and to do this terrible thing in the government's own home, right? So all of this was happening with me un, un, be unbeknownst to me. So I get off the plane at the airport in Ottawa, and I'm immediately whisked into a windowless room and searched head to toe, and all my stuff is strewn all over the place, and they're going through papers and so on, because they've got to make me out to be a very sinister person. And I think, just looking at me, you can tell I am a really sinister terrorist type person. Uh, More words than <laughs> So this went on and on and on. Uh, and, and I was taken to... Um, to a, a departure lounge to be put on a plane to be sent back to the U.S. Um, and then there was, wait a minute, wait a minute, we have to, this consultation, so the consultation was going on. It turned out that the, um, 
uh, Canadian Union of, Pub of uh, Public Employees, uh, staff person in charge of public relations, was uh, had come out to the airport to meet me and was wondering what's going on. And they said, well, the plane hasn't landed. And she found out the plane had landed. And then they said, well, we don't know if he was one of the passengers. Well, she was pretty sure I was making this appointment, right? So she, um, so she got on the horn, and she had her list you know, of all, all major media people. And uh, the idea was, find out what's going on with the government. Uh, and why is George not known to be where he was supposed to be? And so they finally, embarrassed by the media calls, had to let him go. So I actually got to put my feet on Canadian soil after, <laughs> after so long. They've been on the phone with FBI to get my record because I do have an arrest record. And so they've been on all these things and it didn't work for them. So sad. And so, uh, you know, I was trying to be my compassionate Quaker self. It was a little hard because it was extremely annoying. And I'd just been on a flight for whatever, 30 hours. And I was just so exhausted. And then somebody said, uh, well, George, so we're taking you to a place to go to sleep, but do you want to just uh, stop and, you know, get some get something to eat or whatever? And I said, well, I am starving, so could we stop? So we stopped at a place, and there were two police officers, uh, like, in a corner taking a break, you know, a coffee break or something, and they see him come in and, uh, and pick up some food and take it out in the car. Next thing you know, those guys in a cop car are signaling for our car to drop this. Oh pull over, and then they go through the car every bit, inch by inch, looking for something that they could nail us on. Or something. Oh, wow. And I thought, wow, land of the free, home of the brave. <laughs> you know, we we USers are used to thinking of ourselves as retrograde compared with you, and, 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 and we are. But anyway, you know, it was kind of a disillusioning moment yeah. for, for me. But the good news was, that because the government was so busy um, trying to prevent this training from happening and getting to the bottom of all the sinister people involved, it, it developed a trip, it became the thing to do to go to this training. <laughs> <laughs> so nationally known leaders of NGOs and so on all signed up for this training. So the next day when I was uh, you know, showing up with a couple of other trainers to do this, the room was full three different television with uh, you know on those mounted things that go all over the room and everything and cables everywhere and journalists everywhere to cover this awesome event that was full of national Canadian leaders all of whom were basically doing that to the government uh, and and so it was a fantastic propaganda victory for the movement, right? But I go in there and I see this circus, and I say, how can we conduct a training in the middle of all this media circus? And they said, well, yes, they are going, they, some of them are live, coast to coast, covering and, and building it as an educational service, CBC, Educational service, so for the to see what a civil disobedience training looks like led by an internationally known trainer. And I think this is totally impossible. We can't do the work we need to do. And they said, not to worry, not to worry. So this is this is for the education of Canada. And we've arranged a church across town that we haven't told anybody about, but except the participants, and we're gonna go over there and do the actual training. So that's what we did. But the good news was the next day, the actual event happened, and as you know, it was incredibly successful. People did not, of course, seize. <laughs> the, but the amount of publicity that had been given to this whole song and dance completely worked against the government's will. And, uh, and of course, we don't have this. Uh, and congratulations, how about a round of applause to you? For, because this was the Canadian people standing up for themselves and refusing to allow the government to pull something over on them. So how about that? So I'm so blessed to be part of people who will stand up for the government seven. And I understand you did it again today and that you are just willing to keep doing that and I get to be part of this. So I'll be able to tell people's story later about you. But the thing, the thing that I'm really emphasizing here is 
that what I get to do is share stories from people's successes so that we can learn from success. My granddaughter's a pastry chef, and every once in a while she comes home with a big smile on her face and says, I got in touch with so-and-so, a chef at another restaurant in Philadelphia, and they showed me the secret of their ice cream. Or, yeah, something else, like that, right? <laughs> and she is so pleased because she says, finding out, you know, getting to be a better and better chef is finding out what the other people do that they do really well and borrowing from that you know, and, and even developing it further. And in the professions, it's called best practices. And what strikes me as a long, lifelong activist from age 12 is that there hasn't been nearly as much of that kind of attitude among us activists as there is among pastry chefs <laughs> or among attorneys, right? Or among social workers or among business executives. That those people do best practices all the time. It's finding out what works. Oh, we're having a problem in this, you know, this place of business. This co-op is having a problem. Maybe there's another co-op somewhere that's had this problem and has solved it, and we can learn from them. Such common sense, right? But what I find is a lot of activists not going about it in that strategic way, that practical way, finding out what works. And also, to be true, uh, finding out what doesn't work because it might be good not to do that again. And there's a very good reason to do what didn't work for somebody else. And so, that's why I wrote the book. Now, I, I have to admit, I didn't want to write the book because I was still tired from writing Viking economics and spending a year and a half on book tour, four countries, 25 states, and I, uh, I was tired and I wanted a break, right? Um, so people started besieging me from both coasts in the U.S. saying, George, we need this book now. The Florida teenagers are all back yet. Yeah, you've heard about them. The women are talking about them. There's insurgencies going on and will be more and more insurgencies going on, standing up against the, the oppression. And, uh, they, and they deserve to have a book that at least um, summarize, tells some of the stories and summarizes some of the lessons learned so people don't have to make every mistake over again. Make sense? So do it, George, and you can do it faster than anybody else because you co-wrote the book that was the Bible of the Civil Rights Movement, which you wrote for the Civil Rights Movement, and but that, of course, is 50 years ago, and that's out of date, so you need to, but you've done it before, so you can do it again, so do it now, do it now. And I said, oh, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. So finally, I said, okay, okay, so I'll call the publisher, I called the publisher, I said, um, well, my friends want me to write this kind of book, but it's not the kind of book you publish. I mean, I look at your list, you've got fiction, you've got poetry, and you've got literary criticism, and so on and so on. And true, you have my book, Viking Economics, appreciate that. But it's not, this isn't your cup of tea. I thought they'd say, yeah, you're right, and then I'd get out of it, right? <laughs> and instead they said, this is just what we want. As the age of Donald Trump, we've got to get everything we can get to accomplish with this. Yes. So, so here it is. So, so you, you, you've, got, you've got the book. Um, so there's nothing else I need to say because I wrote the book, right? And, uh, <laughs> and go get ice cream. Like that, except you have this fabulous food. And you may have some questions, actually. Maybe you do have some questions. So the other thing that I'll just say by way of uh, introduction is that what I was able to do was, was go back 100 years into successful campaigns mostly North America, but some other places too, and ask myself the question, what was successful in these campaigns that might be useful in this particular moment? Because obviously in dealing with history, sometimes stuff is irrelevant you know, for, for today. So I was particularly looking for what is relevant for today that worked, say, for the women's suffrage movement, uh, that worked, obviously, for the civil rights movement, that worked for the labor movement, and so on and so on at different times. And then as I was preparing for this, I was realizing, but wait a minute, I could also turn you on to the most convenient research source you could imagine, as close as the internet, 
that at Swarthmore College, we built over a thousand cases of nonviolent direct action campaigns, some of which failed, and those are instructive, right? Some of which kind of succeeded, kind of, you know, not, not, nothing to write home about. But anyway, worth putting on the database because a discerning eye will see, oh, let's not do that, and oh, but let's do that. And most of the cases turned out because the students doing the research love cases of men, so they have mostly cases of men. So thanks to you, we've got here um, a picture of what this internet resource looks like. It's a total freebie, and what I'm hoping is that I can intrigue you with it. Ah, it needs to warm up. Oh, Do we need a lighter to maybe uh, switch the back you know, with the turn on the So you'll be able to see more easily. So this is what a typical page for a campaign looks like. And you can easily Google this resource called the Global Nonviolent Action Database. And you'll find over a thousand cases that you can page through. So I chose this one uh, for obvious reasons and environmental. Uh, success case. And actually, we score every we score every single one of these cases on a on a scale of zero to ten. So you might want to you might want to search for all the ones that are eight to ten or something, you know, or maybe you are more interested in the middle ones and what went on. And this part is a narrative, so that you can watch the strategy unfold. That's really fun. The methods are there, and those are all the methods in a sequence of six stages of a campaign in that they tried. They tried this, 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 this. Like, you'll find a particular campaign where somebody's in love with a general strike. <coughs> I've always wanted to do a general strike. So let's start our campaign next week, and we'll call for a general strike. Well, you know, it doesn't work, right? <laughs> so phase one, Nobody that we've been able to find has ever pulled off a general strike in phase one of their campaign. So it looks like it's the kind of thing that has to be built up to, right? Does that make sense? So lots of methods. There are 199 methods of nonviolent direct action that we have in here. And it's possible to, uh, to in, on the database, just look at the 199 and page through 199 different methods. Think of that. Next time anybody asks you to join a march or a rally, you would say, how unimaginative. <laughs> how many marches or rallies have I been to in my life? Is this my whole future until I die? Is marches and rallies and the occasional blockade in the streets stopping people trying to pick up their children from childcare? <laughs> is that really my future? Or is there something else we can do? And so the, uh, the, uh, we have the 199 methods there with ex historical examples of every single one. Uh, so you can delve into that. And if you're a little bored with marches and rallies, if you tell you the truth, I am utterly bored by them, then be creative. Get something else. Uh, you can see leaders, partners, allies, and the leads, what went into that, the, uh, what they did about the violence that was, uh, because often there's repressive violence. This database includes a whole bunch of cases in which the people went up against a dictatorship, even a military dictatorship. And most of the cases in here where people went up against a dictatorship, they won with nonviolent struggle. So this afternoon, it occurred to me, I worked uh, with a group of leaders this afternoon, and some of them were sounding a little bit like, oh, I don't know if we can really, you know, overcome this government, the Canadian government's unwillingness to, uh, to do the right thing. I thought, the Canadian government, Trudeau is a military dictator? I mean, like, if there are people who overcame military dictators, 
I'm pretty sure if you can take care of Trudeau, I'm pretty sure he's going to help. So there's just all kinds of possibilities there. And uh, because, and now, now I will just come over here a little bit. Go ahead. Just to I'm, show you, I should stay so camera. much to just make sure I don't hit it. It's okay. The narrative you see goes on and on, and then there are the sources, so you can check all that. But, let's see, you can search for all kinds of things. You can search in that simple way by name, or you can search in a more sophisticated way. Whoops, I don't see the sophisticated thing. Here we go. Uh, and in that, you can identify your own province and find out what people in your province have been up to uh, decades ago or, or recently. And so, and you can, here in the cluster, you can identify, are you more interested in human rights? There are a tremendous lot of indigenous cases, I believe. This database has more cases of indigenous people's struggles, non non struggles, than any other source that I know of. Um, also, uh, African struggles, African American struggles, many kinds of human rights struggles. Uh, economic justice, obviously labor, but many others, including neighborhoods standing themselves, standing up for themselves. Democracy fights, that's where you'll find the dictatorships. I mean, just knock yourself out sometime. Look at all these pathetic dictators who had to leave town because uh, their people wouldn't put up with it anymore. <laughs> Ethnic identity and so on, and peace. So there are all these different ways we also noticed, as we researched more and more, that a lot of times a campaign would set off another campaign next door, and another one, and another one. And so we found these waves of campaigns, and there are way more still to be researched. But there were democracy campaigns in Latin America in 1944, country after country. After the El Salvadorian students overthrew their dictator, the Guatemalan students who used to play uh, football, rivalry, a big football rivalry, they were outraged. How can the Salvadorian state, the students win, and not us? So of course they had to rise up against their dictator too, and throw him out. And so, uh, and then more did that. So you can really see a whole lot of the, 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 the kind of, uh, from the from dictators and oppressors point of view, a kind of epidemic of outbreak, you know, outbreak, nonviolent outbreaks. Uh, that can happen too, and that matters so much because sometimes we feel a little bit like, oh well, if I go after this particular campaign and I win, what have I really won? Because the big picture is so important. But what you sometimes win is to inspire somebody else to do it, and somebody else, and somebody else, and somebody else, and then it can become a wave, and of course the wave will will make an enormous difference. Are there any questions? Yes, please. I hope it's okay to ask a question. I'm just, just curious if, if somebody was uh, wondering whether such, this is like an excellent uh, tool, if somebody was wondering whether such a tool existed, didn't know that it did exist, went to Google, put in some pretty good search terms, do you know how likely it would be that this would uh, show up or has Google got the algorithms that would sort of uh, 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 have to shy away from that particular site? Uh, Oh, a lot, of, a lot of these things do show up when you do particular searches, for example, for countries. Czechoslovakia, uh, Czechoslovakia and Soviets, or something like that. And there'll be books that will come up. Of course, if Google will bring up books and articles, they'll bring up this. And very often, this is one of the first three or four things in the top. No, I'm glad to hear so, that. Yeah, Thank so you. Google has incorporated all of our cases as individual cases as well as a, a, if you were searching, doing a database search, for, search for all databases. Uh, yes? Yeah, I've got another question. Um, both you and Jean Sharp have emphasized how important it is to work strategically, and part of that is what do you do after you've won? Because look what happened to the Arab Spring. Yeah, she's making the point that it's not only winning, like throwing the dictator out, you know, the dictator, uh, the Shah of Iran gets on the plane and comes to the United States <laughs> <laughs> for protection because his people have thrown him out. Uh, but then the, the situation for the Iranians is, what do we do now? Now there's a power vacuum. You know, any vacuum gets filled one way or another, right? So the reason why I wrote uh, 
one reason why I wrote Viking Economics was because the people who overthrew their economic elites, their 1% in those countries, uh, ha already had a plan going in. They had a vision, they had been tested with the people. They'd gone, you know, farms and cities and every place like, this is what we want to do. What do you think? Would you like to live in a society with, say, free higher education and, and you know, all the different things that they said were part of their vision? And would you like that? And of course, a majority of people, non-activists, the majority of non-activists said, yes, we want these things. Well, okay, then come on to, come into the streets with us, or come into you know come into our points of struggle with us, and we will get that. And then they were able to implement because they had had in a sense field tested their plan. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Uh, history here. Thomas Paine, 1776, wrote Common Sense. What can we learn from what he uh, wrote about this? He did some amazing things in his final years. He was buried in an unmarked grave and didn't get much plus rewards for it. But what, how did he manage to pull that off? Or how did that match start a forest fire on the campaign between the American Revolution and the independence? Well, this is the mystery. I mean, I'm not a historian, although I, I'm a sociologist, but I love history. And I'm not aware of any historian that says that they would have been able to predict, you know, exactly the moment when the thing will happen. Uh, and certainly, uh, I mean, activists had a like Lenin expected Germany to have a successful revolution before Russia. You know, he was very surprised when the Russian uh, thing happened in February 1970. We, we're often mistaken. I, would, I was influenced very much by the American civil rights leader, Bayard Rustin, who was the chief strategist for the civil rights movement. He mentored Dr. King, and, uh, and he, uh, every time he was anywhere near, I was sit, sitting at his feet learning. I was a youngster, and I was he just absorbing, right? And he told me a very funny story exactly apropos of that. He said that in the early 50s, you remember our, our movement started in 55 with the Montgomery bus boycott. He said in the early 50s, he and Ella Baker and others in New York City would kind of you know, sit around in the bar in Greenwich Village and say, so, we're gonna have a mass movement someday. <laughs> now, early 50s, you know, I don't know if you ever feel some despair. Why are my neighbors up? You know, I mean, there were no neighbors up anywhere, you know, in the civil, in, in, among black people in the U.S. in the early 50s. It was so dead. You know? And they would be sitting there in the park. Where is it going to start? We know it's going to start somewhere. And then one person at the table would say, it's going to start in Nashville because of Fisk University and Black University. You know? And somebody else would say, no, 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 it'll start in Atlanta because there's more house and there's Spelman. And, you know, they'd make a case for that. And somebody else would make a case for another city. Not one person said, it'll start in Montgomery, Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? But the Montgomery, Alabama Women's Committee that had been nursing this possibility you know, and respected Rosa Parks. <coughs> well, let's see what happens. You know. And as soon as she was arrested, they you know, pushed on the pastors, the black pastors, and this is it, this is our moment, this is our moment. But um, it's, so it's very, very unpredictable. Uh, yeah. So we can't count on that. What we can count on, Byard said, is being nimble and in the meantime, skilling ourselves up so that if it does happen in your neighborhood or seven neighborhoods over and you can get there, I kept saying, look for the people in motion. If you, if you can get there and you have skills to offer, you can make a difference for that movement. Because it very often ignites uh, among people who don't have the, don't have the previous experience, who don't have the, the, you know, the previous skills. And so there is a place for us to show up and say, can I be helpful? And Byer was amazingly humble. You know, like he showed up uh, uh, right away when the Montgomery bus boycott went, and he went to the office, he said, can I help? I, I know how to write press releases. Can I be useful? And most of the people there didn't even know 
he, you know, he had so much talent and experience in nonviolent direct action. He said, "Can I, can I help?" You know, and, well, turns out the guy writes a really good news release. Well, what else do you know, buyer? <laughs> and they'll see you know, his advice and Dr. King. So, yeah, so we can't count on ourselves out, but we need to not depend on accuracy of prediction in this work. Another hand I saw. Okay, in that case, then I get to give you a chance to do some group discernment. Group discernment is when you get to turn wherever you are and create little threes and fours and come up with questions that you think might be useful, a question, especially in your three or four, if you could choose a question, uh, or a challenge. This is a great chance to push back. George, you're probably out of control, arrogant about the power of nonviolence, so what about armed struggle, blah, blah, blah. Push me any way you want to. I love being pushed. Conflict, I have to love conflict. Right? So let's have some conflict, um, and you can raise hard questions, and, and we'll, see, we'll see what we can answer. Would you do that? Turn to each other, threes and fours. What are some of the questions that occur to you about um, winning? No problem. sort of other actions can people who don't necessarily have a lot of time or a lot of experience participate in or what can we sort of what spaces can we open for people who are sort of new care but don't have a lot of experience and want to oh, this is a great question were you able to hear it for people who don't have a lot of time uh, how can they participate uh, so we have a, I have a whole chapter in the book on that uh, something that we invented in the group that I've been involved in the last seven years, it's a new group, we would call it Earthquaker Action Team. Earthquaker Action Team, E-Q-A-T, Equate. We'd like to make a few earthquakes, I guess, but not through fracking. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so what, something we invented was what we call the core team, which is that each action is planned by and run by a group that includes a, a veteran uh, activist, a almost brand new activist in the group, uh, some, and then a couple of medium kind of, you know, some experience, and, uh, and the staff person. And um, one of those people needs to have a big picture of the larger campaign so that this particular action will fit within a big picture. And so it's a core team, usually about five, maybe six people, that actually plans the next action and runs it. And uh, so what that means is, over time, 
new people constantly getting a chance to learn those skills and develop their leadership, become more powerful. It's an empowering process, right? Now, the, maybe you have four weeks to get the next action ready. We do many, many actions. So we, we have two or three of these core teams going at the same time. So let's say your core team has four, four weeks before the date, the big date, right? So that is very intensive time. So people don't volunteer to do that unless they can set four weeks aside. They won't get their teeth fixed during that time or whatever. You know, they'll just put a lot of time and attention into it. And then they carry it off. You know, it's like the day, showtime. The curtain goes up. They're running it. Oh my gosh. And then they do a very intensive evaluation because learning curve is essential. For success, we almost always need a good, steep learning curve, right? And then they're done. Those five people are done. And uh, they and uh, somebody, I haven't been on a core team for a year and a half, for example, because of the uh, core. So that's great. Somebody else needs to take care of the aged mom or whatever, and they can't do it, but only once in a while. So people can set their own pace. So it avoids burnout, but it invites participation in, uh, you know, in, in time and in boundary ways. And we're finding it an enormously flexible way of making sure we always have actions in the hopper, always actions being organized. We, for our first campaign, we did 125 direct actions. And I don't think we could have done it that way without the uh, without the core team concept. So that's described in detail in the book. Um, one of our favorite actions, I must admit, was one that we did fairly repetitively, and that was we were we were up against a bank. We had decided that we were going to go against the bank that was the number one financer of mountaintop removal coal mining in Appalachia which is not only tremendous pollution and carbon pollution, but also twice the cancer rates in the area of the mountain blown up, birth defect rates up. I mean, you name it, it's about as atrocious a way of get, gathering energy as you can imagine. And the bank was making money hand over fist by loaning money to the coal companies to do this. So we said, well, we'll put them out, we'll, we'll force them out of doing that kind of investing. Well, it, was, it happened to be the seventh largest bank in the United States. We started with a group much smaller than this group. It was a living room size group. So I did get some phone calls from friends who said, George, now you have really have lost it. <laughs> <laughs> you're starting with a living size group, and you're going to force the seventh largest bank in the US out of doing that business. I said, well, we'll see. So we obviously had to grow a lot. Your mom was very important in all this, March. Um, and we grew to 13 states before they, and uh, did 125 actions before they finally yielded. It took five years. But you know, when they yielded, within a week, Barclays Bank in London, the 800 pound gorilla, right, of the British Commonwealth. Um, <laughs> The Barclays, which also had been heavily invested in the mountaintop of the money, got out. They announced what they don't mean. Because we found out bankers watch each other. If something looks like a losing proposition, or it's going to be too much trouble. But how do we make trouble? I mean, we're, we're just Quakers. You know, Quakers, don't be scared of Quakers. Are you scared of Quakers? I don't know a single person who's scared of Quakers. But I Quakers. But, but, but these bankers got to be very scared of bankers. And we, because we didn't know anything about banks when we started, we hooked up to the Reinforced Action Network, which had a lot of experience with financial institutions. We said, look, we don't know anything, but we have a lot of heart. We don't have intelligence. You do. Will you be our big sister? I thought, oh, that's cute. Yeah, we'll be your big sister. So they kept feeding in information. And after a couple of years, we had kept experiencing these bankers that we were running into as being afraid of us. I mean, they were like trembling. I remember the first regional president of the bank that we met with. It was around a board table. And I was sitting so I could see his legs from, from this angle. And I could see his legs were going like this the whole time. Bank president. 
And uh, I said, so to the Rainforest Action Network, why are bankers so scared of bankers? <laughs> I mean, they closed any number of branches when they heard that we were coming. <laughs> they put a sign in their window, emergency. <laughs> closed. Locking out their own customers. <laughs> Scared. So I said, so I told, I said that I got to look, I, I, I'm not personally scared of Quakers, and I don't know why they would be. And she said, oh, but every institution has its own culture. Banking is, the culture of banking is that you get merit points for reading quickly somebody. Somebody comes for a loan. If you can read them quickly and say yes or no, that's a plus for you. Just like get them. So the people who move up in a bank are the people who are these like quick readers, figure people out real quick. And they keep moving up and up. So what the thing is that we did was that we were unreadable. We were disruptive. But we weren't wearing, you know, multiple uh, this and that, you know, black black clothes. We didn't look like the you know, classic disruptors. We looked like the kinds of people who you could scan by saying, oh, thank you for your concern. We will set up a commission and do some research on that, you know. And the, the, because, you know, as professionals, you can buy them off. They'll go off and say, oh, this is really wonderful. The bank is going to look into it. Yeah, this is great. So, um, so we didn't fit any of the stereotypes, and they couldn't figure us out. And partly, it, uh, it was because we did invent the Quaker holdup. Now, I will admit that. <laughs> you know, it's important to be culturally consistent. It, uh, you know, community organizers will say, you know, melt into the culture. And American culture is very rich in bank holdups. <laughs> right? I mean, it's classic, right? There are movies about bank holdups and, all that, you know, yay. And so uh, we thought we ought to fit into our culture, but of course it had to have a Quaker slant to it. So the Quaker bank holdup was to go in, and we could do this with a small number, we could do this with a dozen people. We would just file in, single file, into the bank, go into the middle, sit on the marble in a circle, and come up into prayer. <laughs> Everything would stop. And the, you know, the customers lined up, and, like, like, and the tellers, what's going on, what's going on? And the bank manager freaking out, oh my god, oh my god, and security guards, do something, do something. And we knew the security guards couldn't arrest us, they don't have that power, right? So they'd say, get out of here, and we'd say, yeah. or start testifying about nature and mountains, or something like that, or people who getting cancer. And uh, we'd sing, we did a lot of singing. And it would drive them crazy. So, uh, so we did back holdups over and over again. I'll never forget the training that we did in Florida, a, a colleague of uh, the Equate and me. Um, and uh, it was a one day Dalmas training. And the, 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 my colleague Brian said, OK, so we'll start out today. We noticed there's a branch of this bank just down the street. So our, our way of starting the workshop will be we'll go down the street. And we'll go in there and we'll pray on the, 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 the little the floor. And people went in the shop. In the, you can imagine. Whoa! That's maybe the end of the day of training. That's not the way you start training. <laughs> and said, no, this will, it'll, it'll, it won't be for big, like, you know, it'll be just to, just to go in there and you know, pray a little bit. Melt people. <laughs> oh my God. So, so people got to feel real scared and everything, which is really important in direct action. Often you get that chance of get the adrenaline pumping. Mm -hmm. you know, we'll call it excitement, not fear. <laughs> because, uh, it's the same physiological thing, you know, fear and excitement the same. So, ah, you're excited. You're so excited. <laughs> Are we all excited now? Yes, that's great. So then we go down and we get we do this thing. And uh, and the, the, when we would do that as a training, uh, it would always be a facilitator who would be in charge. Uh, we called it the action lead. And so um, uh, 
but we, we cast the other roles. And in the book, I explain also how much help it is for newbies to know that there are roles assigned in carrying out an action. A number of you nodding your heads. And so, um, so we said, okay, so we need um, a police liaison, somebody to be liaison if the police come. And uh, this 14-year-old middle schooler jumps up and says, that's me. I'm going to be the police liaison. <laughs> Whoa, okay, all right, good for you. And we had the other roles, the other person relate to the bank branch manager and so on, the liaison of various people. And then we, we went and on the way to the bank, the, an 18 year old, we had a bunch of young people and also an 80 year old in our group. And uh, the, the, the 18 year old was feeling a little envious that the 14 year old had a role. <laughs> but the 18 year old did not. So he went to Ryan and he said, hey, I'm going to be actually lead. And, Whoa, I don't know. So Ryan says, what do you think, George? And I said, he seems pretty centric. Let's, let's give it a try. I and mean, we'll be there you know, in case. So OK, OK, you'll be actually lead. He was so proud. So he led us into the back, single file, and lined us up and sat us down. And, uh, we always have a spiritual anchor, so that's somebody who prays us through the entire action. And we just, you know, it just went so beautifully. And the 14-year-old, uh, the who was the uh, tall for his age, but nevertheless, um, who was the police, police liaison, he did what he needed to do, which was to stand in a spot where the, he could see the, the door into the bank, and they could see him when they came in. So sure enough, the branch manager calls the police, so they start coming in. He steps forward and he says, hello, I am the police liaison, and my job is to communicate between you and the group. <laughs> so they roll their eyes, walk right past him, right? And does he take that? No. He catches up with them. I'm the police liaison, and your communication with the group needs to be through me. They roll their eyes again. I was so proud of them. Wow, if he can do that, why can't we all do that? Right? Yeah, 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 that was great. That was great. So, yeah, so that's part of uh, our response to the question what about uh, people who, you know, who can't? say, I'm now giving my life for the next 10 years to the movement or something like that. They need to, they can dip in, dip out. They can still be in charge of their lives. And at the same time, participate vigorously in something for the time that they do have that is, is itself growthful and empowering for them. And then a very cool thing about that, the way that loops around is that if you have a whole bunch of people who are experiencing that, they, it's okay with, it's more okay with them that they don't win quick, right? I mean, the five-year campaign is a long campaign. We had so little turnover. We kept growing, growing, growing. We had very few people get tired and drop out because they were growing. They were experiencing more power, including more personal power in their other pursuits because our culture was an empowering culture as a movement. And the useful thing about that is that it has to do with that question earlier about what about if you overthrow the dictatorship? What do you have there? Well, what if you have a movement of empowered people, right? Who just won't accept the next dictator, the next would-be dictator who wants to take over, like in Egypt, after the Arab Awakening, right? But because the movement itself is so empowering, and so full of skill building that when the power vacuum opens, you have all these people, including our 14 year old, ready to step right in there and say, I know what my job is, you deal with me. <laughs> Another question? Yes? Um, we had quite a bit of stuff about the media. Um, and I know that there's a lot of people who are saying that question really great. First, what do we do when the, uh, how do we organize and strategize our movement when the other side? adopted all of our progressive strategies. Oh, that's the Democratic Party. <laughs> 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 oh, you're thinking about Alberta. Uh, yeah.
Yeah, I mean, uh, trying to deal with us by co co trying to co-opt us by giving well, math, math. And math. The strategies have been co-opted. Yes. Oh, yes. There have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, in the in the U.S., the, the Democrats co-opted the civil rights movement. It was strongest when it remained independent, 55 to 65, and then when the Democrats co-opted it, the civil rights movement lost power, lost steam. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a favorite trick, uh, so I'm glad you raised it. So this though has to do then with vision. Now, this was another point that Byron kept making in the civil rights movement context. He said, we need to have a vision that says what we want that we think will en enable racism fully to be overcome. And that's got to be heavily economic in character. Not just economic, but it needs to include it. In fact, I've heard him say in so many rooms, he said, um, look, now that the civil rights movement is really growing rapidly and, and, and it, we're up to scale, we need to take on the economy. Because if we don't take it on now, in 50 years, we'll still have ugly racism. Exactly that. So, uh, but the, the civil rights movement, that, so that's learning from others' mistakes, right? They failed to do that. Uh, you folks have the LEAP manifesto as a big step forward. They didn't do their LEAP manifesto kind of, you know, equivalent. And so not being able to be clear about what they wanted it was easy for the Democrats to do their seductive, hey, yeah, you've been on the margins, you've been on the outside so long, we can't like a seat at the table, because seat at the table, then you're really in on it, you know, then you're really, you know, like that. And for people who have been marginalized especially, that is very seductive, right? Oh, good, now we're not on the outside anymore, we're on the inside, that's great. And actually, uh, losing power like crazy. So, um, so I would say the, the most important aspect is vision, having a vision of what we want. And that's, that then turned out to be the case in researching the, the, the Norwegians and Swedes and things. They all had a very radical, for their time, a very radical vision. And that's why they got to the top of the heap for all the nations and, to, and multiple justice criteria. I'm going to ask our second question. Yes. There is a movement happening right now. There are thousands of people walking from Honduras to the American And all we're hearing is that they're terrorists, that they're nasty people, they're criminals. Why, is, why are their stories not being told? Why are we not hearing about that? Wow, did you hear that? It has to do with the, the so called caravans that are coming from Honduras and other. Central American countries up through Mexico to the U.S. border and in the U.S. anyway. Is that true in Canada too? Yeah. That the media, where, where the, the loudest voices are saying they're a threat instead of a potential asset? No. No. Don't hear so much here. No. Oh. Uh, can I move? <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah, there are some sources. Um, I have not the there. dominant sources. And what's happening in Canada is more and more uh, people are turning uh, into, uh, we're letting too many people in. We've got illegals walking across our border. We've got to stop this. And that's becoming the new mantra in Canada uh, as well. So how do you how do you shift the media focus so that there's a different story that can be told? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the suggestion I make in the book is that we shift our way of thinking at moments like that from defense to offense. That there's been a tendency, a very natural human tendency, when you see something coming that seems to be wanting to take away from previously achieved gains, to defend those previously achieved gains. If you were immigrant friendly, now it looks like people come and say, no, no, let's be immigrant unfriendly, right? Um, so it's, it's, I don't know, but it's, but we're good the way we are. We're good the way we are, you know, like on the defense. And that is a basic mistake. Gandhi used to say over and over to his people, we will never win until we go on the offense. And in that respect, generals agree. Military generals will tell you, you never win a war on the defense. You win on the offense. 
and uh, <coughs> folk wisdom on the other side of the border. I didn't know about it here. Folk wisdom is the best defense is. So, I mean, maybe you don't agree with Gandhi or generals, but you've got to agree with folk wisdom. <laughs> okay, so best defense is an offense. So, I would move the goalposts. Say, the trouble with Canada is not enough immigrants. <laughs> look at the population profile, look at this, look at all this space, look at all this undeveloped water. I don't know what your case would be, but make the case and start a reverse caravan or something like that to recruit. <laughs> recruit immigrants, send emissaries all over, you know, all the multiple countries. We're looking for immigrants, please, we want immigrants. And have community, those grassroots dimensions of that would be very important, of course. So you have local communities saying, we could use at least three families from El Salvador. We need at least this, and so on. And then we'll send an emissary, and we'll underwrite the expenses, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, so this great grassroots upsurge of Canadians, we want immigrants, more immigrants, more immigrants, and change the conversation, and put the other side on the defensive. Yes? I don't know that. I don't know that. I'll, I'll bet there's a way if you actually, you know, think about it. And here I am, you know, saying, "Yay, Canada!" And I don't know anything. I mean, I just don't know. my ignorance. But I'll bet there's a way of, uh, of, of, of uh, there's some way. You should probably brainstorm ten ways of being able to go in the offensive with regard to that. That's my major point. Yeah. I was just curious, you were talking about the 199 different strategies uh, and your system of ranking them in terms of effectiveness from 1 to 10. Can you just maybe speak to, I'd be curious what sort of the top 10 most effective strategies are. Oh, uh, we didn't rank them that way, actually. Because we think, uh, if you have, for an, an example of a tactic would be general strike. Another example would be in March. Actually, March is one of them, and rally is one of them. And another one is a sit-in, for example, uh, or Quaker hold-up, if you want to call it. <laughs> um, so there are multiple tactics. One uh, favorite one of my students when I was teaching at University of Pennsylvania was this this robing, just taking off their clothes. They were part of the student sweat shop uh, movement, anti-sweat shop movement in the States, and they loved making their point about why this college store should not sell sweatshop-made products by taking off the clothes okay? and then going to the president of the, of the, of the university. And you'd be surprised. If you, if, if you look at the 199, come to this room and then, uh, and then see the cases, you'll be surprised. Liberia, just many, many countries have done that. Uh, here in this country, it's the Duke of Bors, right? yeah. The Duke of Bors did that. The Duke of Bors uh, historic. So anyway, so there are multiple, <laughs> multiple packages. Now the reason why they can't be ranked to one to ten is because um, a perfect tactic on the col that college campus might be the worst tactic in another context. So tactical uh, use is hugely contextual. Very, very contextual. So what we ranked from 1 to 10 was the success of each campaign, not of the tactics. So we look at a campaign, we ask, what was their objective, for example, to throw out the Shah of Iran? Okay, so boom, what did they achieve? They threw them out, so they get a 10. Or that Cree case that I showed you. We look at the objectives of each of each movement and ask how did they do, and then we rate them according to the degree of success. And but all those coding things are, by the way, public and they're right there so you can check them. Another question, yes? How, what are the durable results of the sure to say? Let's do a little research on fasting <laughs> and how that works out for folks. And uh, in our case, the results of research was that uh, most of us did a, a week-long fast. 
Um, and and uh, a lot of us did it publicly, like I, I was a professor at Swarthmore College, so I would, I, I announced to the campus I would be at such and such a place every day from noon to two or something like that, and I, you know, made sure I looked hungry. Uh, and, and people would come by and I said, like George, I, I'm very hungry. <laughs> the gospel choir came and sang to me. It was very, very sweet, giving spiritual sustenance. So, you know, so a lot of us did a week, but some people can't do a week. Two, two days is good for them, right? Uh, a member of my Quaker meeting did 40 days. It did it in the uh, Muslim way of, uh, you know, uh, uh, but, but he very modified, like basically water and some uh, vitamins in the evening but all day long fast for 40 days. So you lost a lot of weight. So people could could make their individual choices, but nobody was challenged to uh, ask you for a day. In a grassroots movement, may I have something analogous to your staff person? Might not have anything analogous to? The staff person that you just described. Oh, oh, it could be, um, it could be the consultant. Yeah. We got a consultant. We, one of the early things we did was to find somebody who liked us and understood Quakers. He wasn't a Quaker, but he liked our campaign, uh, but had way too much other stuff to do, but was very experienced. He was a very experienced person. We said, we would love to have a consultant who has you know, some degrees of separation so we can go to you and ask your advice about this and that. And then, uh, and, and that, would, that was tremendously helpful. For example, we uh, decided that we wanted to shut down the shareholders meeting of, of this bank. Once a year, you know, they would have a required annual meeting. And for three years in a row, we went and we were polite. And we waited for a question and answer, you know, and then we'd get up and denounce their blowing up the mountains. So we thought, but the heart of successful campaigning is very often to escalate. Not to just stay on the same level, but to escalate, escalate. So now that we've done uh, these much, very modest things of shareholders, now let's shut down the meeting. So uh, we figured out how to do that. We bought shares so we could get into the meeting. And the 16 of us got in. And, uh, and then the idea was to uh, disrupt, disrupt, disrupt until they shut down the meeting. So uh, now the thing is, a lot of our group happened to have been brought up middle class. And they reported that they felt that they had been brought up to be wolf followers. Do you catch my drift? Anybody here brought up middle class? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> rule followers. That's the instinct. The instinct is to follow the rules. Right? So, so as the day got closer to, for us to do this, the anxiety rose and rose and rose among the sixteen of us. Like, oh my God, we're gonna, you know, and it's not our meeting; it's their meeting, and we're gonna disrupt it and shut it down. And, ooh, uh, uh. <laughs> And it was getting very, uh, and, and uh, so we went to our consultant and said, Daniel, uh, Daniel, by the way, has two chapters in the book, Daniel Hunter, awesome, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. Uh, and uh, we said, Daniel, do you have some advice? We have the, all this escalating anxiety. And uh, he said, oh yeah, well, okay, uh, so let's see, what are Quakers good at, what are Quakers? Quakers are good at meetings, having meetings, right? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> got us. <laughs> so, yeah, we're good at that. He said, okay, well, then that makes it easy. Just go in there and have a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> have an agenda, work out, know who's going to speak to each item on the agenda. Go in and disperse yourselves all over the auditorium among the other shareholders. And then when the uh, CEO sitting on the stage says, and now we will, uh, uh, it might be that one of you is called to address item number one on your agenda. <laughs> and you'll get up and do it very loudly. And what could be more natural than to have a meeting? It just happens to be the same time and place. <laughs> That's a shareholder's meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. So, and there was a member of the uh, equate of our group 
who was a member of the, actually the 1%. So in a way, she would feel very happy to be with all the other 1%ers who were on the bank, right? Um, she was a professor of logic at Princeton University, um, and she had never committed civil disobedience before, or civil disobedience, but she said, this is time to stand up. And so she, and she put on her best, you know, blue wool suit, her best pearls. I mean, she was so turned out. She looked like, um, she was like, whatever, 75 years old. She looked so great. And uh, we were, we were, and we came in, and we came in early enough so we could be all over the thing. And the idea was, and the police would arrest us. They'd have to like paw over <laughs> regular shareholders, you know, pull us out, maximize the disruption. You know, we noticed that the back was full of police, full of police, because they knew perfectly well what we were going to do because they surveilled us. And by the way, you know, if any of you know about secrecy and, and uh, uh, security culture, we take just the opposite position. We are so proud that they're surveilling us because it says that we matter. We are worth their time and attention and money to make sure they know what we're doing. Awesome. Is your group surveilled? Well, why not? So, uh, so we're delighted. You know, they always know what we're going to do. So we we in the auditorium that day, and we're cool. Yeah, we can doing one more Quaker meeting. Oh my goodness, no problem. We walk in, there. and uh, the CEO immediately comes over to me. We never met. Well, hello, George. Kind of expecting you. <laughs> and uh, and so it was exactly. You know, he sat there. He said. Okay, well, how are we reading the minutes? So the secretary of the corporation gets up and starts reading the minutes, but how about that? It happens to be agenda number one. Time for us to jump up. And just as he's about to call the police, because they're right back there itching, itching to get us, right? Um, but he doesn't really want the front page of the, of the financial, <laughs> of the business page, to feature uh, the rest of us. So that, that's the place where I happened to be the first one. I just thought, sat down. Oh, you see the visible side of relief. And so, and, and now we'll have the reading of the, and now we'll have the treasurer's report. So the treasurer gets over here and starts reading the number. But wouldn't you know it, that happens to be the next item on the agenda for us. And so, <laughs> And that's what we kept doing, kept doing, kept doing. And the man was so frustrated because he didn't want to arrest us. And he, we would still, we keep stopping, but we were interrupting. Whose meeting is this anyway? After, it's supposed to be an hour and a half meeting. After 20 minutes, he throws up his hands. Now, I've read in novels about people throwing up their hands. But have you ever in real life seen anyone throw up their hands? He throws up his hands and he says, this meeting's a jerk. <laughs> so the following year, they went to Florida instead because they thought we weren't there. And we shut them, we shut them down again. So anyway, it's uh, uh, multiple tactics are available, 199 at least. And the quarter meeting, I guess that'd be number 200. <laughs> and and just, uh, just have yourselves involved, but, uh, but be contextual. Yeah. Uh, my question, George, is about electoral politics and uh, those of us that have worked in parties such as the New Democratic Party here in Canada. Uh, it, it's often said that the NDP and other roles in the Democratic Party in the United States, they run from the left and then they govern from the right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've worked for years off and on, years, for example, in the New Democratic Party, only to have all those things sold out when they were elected to government. And we can see now with uh, the Premier in, in Alberta and the Premier in BC and the federal Liberal government, to a great extent, being captive to the energy industry and to the fossil fuel industry. So I'm wondering if maybe with even with reference to the midterm U.S. elections, which we all follow here in Canada, I even went to a party that night to watch it all, uh, what, what tactics would the Quakers use to try and hold these elected people accountable. Uh, and, and, you know, I realize there's issues around spending reform and big money in campaigns, but what would you do at a practical level to try and elect some people that will move in the right direction or the, the progressive direction in the election? Quakers have a variety of views on that subject. There's no unity, particularly on that. So I'll just tell you mine. 
in my view, is very influenced by the civil rights movement. Because the civil rights movement, arguably, made the greatest progress when the Democrats were trying to hold them completely at arm's length. And of course, the Republicans were as well. So no uh, major political uh, party wanted to touch the, the, and they won their biggest pictures that way. Selma, how many of you have watched the movie Selma? Yeah, I try, I try to watch it once a year. It's a remarkable movie. All of our groups should be watching Selma. So much information. The second time you watch it, you get even more out of it. And uh, the, there you had uh, Martin Luther King in the Oval Office with Lyndon Bain Johnson, who was the most, in most ways, most powerful person in the world. And felt like that. And was known, his whole track record had been manipulating people and doing, you know, blah, blah, blah. he had more sense than Trump about talking about it, but he just went ahead and did it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Lyndon Baines Johnson. And there you see in the Oval Office Johnson ordering Dr. King to do thus and such. And of course, there would be many rewards, you know, if he did, if King did. And King saying, no. <laughs> That's power. That's the kind of power that 17th century Quakers had. That's the kind of power that early Christians had. I mean, as far as I know, the early Christians did not have a lobbying arm. <laughs> Working with the Caesars. <laughs> if you want to see power forcing against his will, the most powerful person in the world, Lyndon Johnson, look at that movie and ask yourself, should we the people have that kind of power? Yes! That makes democracy real when it's we the people who have that kind of power. Right? Not the prime minister, not the president. But the only way to generate that kind of power is to do what the civil rights movement did which was grassroots exercise of non-monetary action campaign and forcing a crisis such that the government had to move. Had to move. Forced to move against his will. Totally against his will. The stakes were enormous. The Democratic Party stood to lose the South its most reliable base for what, a hundred years or something, roughly. And they did lose their base. The stakes were enormous. John Kennedy did not want to hear from the Civil Rights Movement. For the same reason. The Democrats could not afford to agree to what the Civil Rights Movement demanded. And they were forced to demand, forced against their will to do it. Now that is power, and that's the power we deserve and the power that is available to us through non-monetary action, through campaigns, sustained and escalating campaigns. And it's the only power that I know of that can do that, except for armed struggle. And the track record for non-monetary action campaigns is twice the success rate of violent campaigns. So not even armed struggle can as reliably deliver that product as nominal campaigns. So you can see why, from my point of view, fooling around with politicians is like secondary. And in the US, where it's very clear the economic elite runs things, I mean, Warren Buffett has admitted it, I mean, to any number. There's so much empirical evidence now that it's the economic elite, it's the 1% that runs things in the US. And the, the politicians are puppets. Why would you, if you were sitting and watching a marionette show, then get so fascinated with the marionettes? If you're interested in power, you're really interested in the puppeteers. So that's my point of view. But I'm not uh, speaking for the the body, yes. Uh, sorry. Oh, I've always spoken. Oh, okay. Yeah.
Yesterday we witnessed uh, media censorship up at the Unisoton camp. And uh, what, what is your fix on that? Well, expect that. Expect an unfriendly media or a media that doesn't do what we want to do. We're talking about authorities censoring. They cut off the Wi Fi, they cut off the cell phones. Oh, I didn't know about that. But in general, uh, authority is censoring media. Oh, I don't even have an opinion because I just don't know the situation well enough. No, I mean in your experience. I keep remembering Gandhi didn't have, not only didn't have iPhones, yeah. <laughs> he didn't have phones. <laughs> Way bigger than either Canadians or U.S. Have, Americans have done um, through uh, runners. I mean, after a major demonstration, runners pre-assigned would rush off and run village to village, to village to village. And we're talking in India. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of villages. And go to the village square and say, "This is what happened yesterday," or in some cases, "This is what happened three days ago." <laughs> if they could do that, <laughs> we could do it. I mean, yeah. So we are not. It's lovely to have the technology. I mean, the Earthquake Action Team uses social media a lot, but if we don't have the tools, we need to know we are such resourceful people. The power is always here. You know, here rather than the power, let's not assign power to the props, to the tools that are useful, but too often we exaggerate their power. Oh gosh, I, I know the lady in the back has been wanting to get that, yes. Okay, yes. Uh, well, you were talking about yes. grass root, uh, gra grass uh, I'm root not exercise. You though, I'm I said you're talking about grass root exercise um, uh, of no nonviolent campaigning. Why do you think that's not happening? Well, we, we elected the government here. Certain things were promised, nothing happened. We are still not really. Uh, citizens are not jumping out and non-violently expressing their views on things. Uh, same thing, US, look at who, who the idiot was elected. And how happened? There are, there are obviously campaigns, but not really even close enough so what do you think? What's happening? Why, why, why are we so paralyzed? Well, I, I, um, I mean, I think there are historical and sociological reasons for why people stay passive when they can be active and so on. But I also, in the book, I'm really stressing ways in which we aren't using our full power. That we're not, for example, doing, uh, for example, by being ritualistic and doing marches and rallies all the time, uh, we're just not, you know, we're not going to get the rewards that we want out of that. We're not, we're not going to be high achieving if we just keep falling back on stuff. If we, instead of doing campaigns, we do one-offs, you know, now we all do that march. A month later, now we all do that. Instead of a campaign, an escalated campaign. So what the book is, it's all about how to get excellent. And then let's come back to your question after we've been excellent. Based on history, when people do all the, you know, most of the right things, they win. So let's learn from winning. I, this afternoon I challenged anybody who goes to a climate meeting or any kind of meeting where they hear a rehearsal of what's wrong. See a movie about rising seas or hear about the this or the that, this terrible the human rights situation. Is, you know, and, uh, and go to meeting after meeting with the usual suspects, people who already agree, and hear more information about what's wrong. What, it's not even a good, it's not even a waste of time. It's a negative to keep hearing all the negative stuff that's wrong, all the bad stuff that's wrong. What we need to use our membership meetings and be in each other's living rooms also to do is to watch Selma, is to watch multiple films that have come out. The, the, uh, the, the 
film called Pride from Britain, which shows the LGBT people um, uniting with the, 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 the strikers and the labor strikers and so on and so on. There are so many great movies that show us winners and how they win. So it's really on us, first of all, to decide, let's be winners, and then let's learn from people who win, and then let's us win. So I'm such a believer in the human capacity to learn. Let's do that. Yes. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to your process in your group of, in terms of determining where the pressure points are. Like, why did you go after you know this bank and that? Yeah. And I think in particular because you know we're dealing with a lot of like pipeline stuff, which has a lot of overlapping issues of colonization, and capitalism, yeah. and environmental stuff. But it's sometimes difficult to to know you know what where's the most strategic place for us to make our movement because it feels like we just try to do all the different things and then it feels really dispersed instead of maybe having enough energy to, to make some change, but figuring out where those pressure points are. Figuring it out, figuring out a whole chapter on that. And it's because target selection is huge. Saul Alinsky, a century ago or something, kept emphasizing, let's win a few things because of the vulnerability, you know, they're the lower, lower hanging fruit. Let's learn some things, get our morale up that way, and then tackle more difficult things. But how do you assess what's easier and what's harder? So in the case of the bank, for example, we knew that it was a bank on the move. It was a bank that wanted to grow and grow and grow and become a national bank someday. And it was a depositor-oriented bank. It wanted to attract customers. Great. Let's deter people from being customers by ruining their brand. They had billboards up saying, the greenest bank you could ever want to bank with. Thank you. <laughs> we had people moving their money out of the bank and putting it into credit unions, and, you know, into uh, community banks, that kind of thing. We were just on it because we knew that was their vulnerability. They really wanted millennials. You know, get them young, and then you can keep them as customers forever, right? Oh, great. So we, they went to college campuses, first week of school, and set up booths, you know, and said, you know, come to us, Green Bank, you know, you love us, you know, blah, blah, blah. So we would show up on those campuses and put something right next to them and say, guess what they're doing? Guess what they're doing? And there's a community bank around the corner. Like that drove them crazy. So, yeah. so. Find out what the vulnerabilities are, and different banks would have different vulnerabilities for the, for different targets, obviously. So it does take some power research and, and knowing what knowing what their own objectives are because you play with their minds in a way. Um, how do you recognize when you're doing something that's not things. So it's finding out what they did. I tell some of that in the book. Training is key. Training really empowers people to be able to deal with whatever is coming up. And so we, we do, we do, even the most, what looks like a, a kind of insipid, you know, uh, action that some core team came up with and well, nobody's really inspired by it, but we're, you know, uh, uh, we'll still do a training for it. So we're training, training, training constantly, trying to build skills for the unexpected. And, and, uh, and if we have reason to think, for example, black block will come, then we, of course, have to train for that. So now we're called by other, other movement groups in the Philadelphia area when they're expecting trouble. We're asked to come and be marshals or peacekeepers. And then we do specific trainings on peacekeeping, on marshalling, on crowd control, on all that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I was beaten up my first time being arrested uh, by a police officer. So there's the question of protection. And uh, 
It was uh, it was just like uh, I'm in training. I mean, I, 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 there was a pair of police officers, and one of them started clubbing me, and I uh, I thought, oh right, I know what to do now, you know. So I started breathing deeply, unlocked my knees, get more like like that, and started praying, and um, and his partner stopped it. Whereas if I done that, you know, then his partner would have joined it. So, yeah, so thank goodness. That's one of the ways we have a huge advantage over the civil rights movement. They did a lot of pioneering in training, thank goodness. That's why they, that's one reason they got through so much violence. They encountered far more violence than, than we're going to. But uh, nevertheless, training has, has also grown since then. So the art of training, the technology of training has grown a lot. Training for change is an awesome source. And I mentioned that in the uh, book. Yes, March. Um, so my question is, how do you move a movement from being just like an idea in your head or a cause that you care about to like something that there is public support behind? Such a great question. Um, so uh, I, I think there's actually several steps that people tend to have in common when they do that. One step is to talk with people who might be interested and get them together as a group. And uh, I have in the book advice on what kind of people you should recruit in terms of mix of skills and talents. Because if you have all one kind of person, you're going to get an off-balance group. So I describe kinds of people who are uh, valuable in a group, and you, and once you read it, you'll be able to. Oh yeah, I know that person. Oh right, that's what. Oh, that's what I am. <laughs> and you can figure out, you know, who to invite in that initial group, and then how to support them to become more groupy. Um, it, it it can be very valuable to have a coach. For example, the group I'm talking about I had a coach because it was me. Actually, that's why I know. <laughs> and I was because I was a you know veteran activist. So you might be able to find a veteran activist and say, hey, would you give us six, the first six months of, of our group's life to coach us? And that might be you might show up, or we might just be able to come to you and say, hey, what about this? What about that? Um, so load up the resources. You can tell I talked about a consultant. I talked about a big sister organization, Rainforest Action Network. I talked about a coach. That's three things in our favor to create a really zingy group, which is the group you know. <laughs> um, so those things are useful. But then there's a, a strategy thing that really helps in terms of recruiting more people, because a small group can only do so much. And uh, that's also in the book, I call it a spectrum of allies. If you can imagine a kind of half of a, a half of a circle, and on this side, you've got, uh, you've got us, the activists, yay, the initiators, yay, the awesome people. And on the other side of the spectrum is the opponent, the bank, or whatever, the government, the dictator, or whatever. And what we uh, say, believe is that uh, that half circle can be cut into chunks according to uh, their relationship to the cause. So the chunk closest to us is the pie, if it's a pie, like top half of pie, that group is people who are inclined, but they need to be talked with several times before they, you know, say, associate with us in some way. Maybe they would say, I'll come to every other demonstration. So, okay. And then there's the next group that says, well, no, we'd rather lobby. Is there a role for us? Oh, well, maybe you can come up with a role for them that would be support them, be helpful. And then the middle of the spectrum, of course, are people who don't want to take sides. No, it's not so clear yet. I mean, it's a very responsible bank in some ways, blah, blah, blah. So those folks in the middle, you know, you need to win them over. And so, and then there's the somewhat hostile and the pretty hostile and the opponent, right? So you've got all those slices. Then the fun thing about strategizing is you are in charge of deciding who are you going to go after and which tactics are you going to use. And you might use different tactics for the people in the middle, like on straddling the fence. You might use, let's say, softer tactics or whatever um, than you would who are you know, with you in well, most ways. I mean, just like you 
could swing them over, get yourself beaten up or something, and then they'll come over and you join you. Something like that. So, so it's um, being a little flippant here, but anyway, uh, you get the idea that that you can actually do planning, and uh, and then you need to train your personnel to be able to do the outreach. Which some people are shy; they need a little training. Uh, you recruit on the phone, door knocking, a lot of techniques. And for a lot of these things that I'm talking about, there are manuals you can find now on the internet now. How to do door knocking, how to do phone, how to do this and that. And it's your turn. Thank you very much. Now, when the winds came in through the hurricane, there was a segment of the population that was off grid. And I think you heard about these people. And they had their solar, uh, whatever, wind, whatever. And they had electricity, they had water. So I'm asking you, it's really nice to have everybody trained to action against the government that is actually operational. But when the operations break down, that factory that we talked about has to be organized for it. And I've always, I have always said, we have to develop a parallel society, period. Because this one that we've got now, the capitalist society, ain't going to last, give it 10, 15 years. Here mm -hmm. it Absolutely. That, that, there's so many benefits to that. One benefit that the Norwegians and Swedes and Danes found through their cooperative movement, developing an infrastructure, what it was, it not only had economic payoff and so on along the way, but it was also hugely reassuring to that middle part of the spectrum who are undecided and who are vulnerable to propaganda about you as being your misfits or your radicals or your commies or your, I don't know what they call you up here, but anyway, you know, um, but are vulnerable to that because they're not going to call you that if you're associated with the kind of activity you're talking about, right? Now, oh, these are decent people who are trying to, you know, uh, are helpful. They're helpful. They're in service. So that's a very big payoff. Another big payoff is that those skill, the skill development that you're involved in talking about because there are real skills involved there, um, are terrific to develop for if, especially for people who don't feel themselves to be skillful. Right? Like in any society, probably much less here than in the U.S., there are people who put themselves down as, well, I don't have much to offer, you know, but can be pulled into the co-op, can be pulled into this or that, and skilled up in that way, and that increases the size of the movement, and also increases, uh, it may increase the class base, since class is so related to, to a higher education and schooling and, uh, and skill base. Um, and it's also a way of testing the vision. Okay, you may have a vision, the League Manifesto, or in, the, in their case, it was a very co-op-oriented uh, vision of an economy, but it's a way of testing it. What, you know, what works and what doesn't. You find out in a disaster, right? What works and what doesn't. And then that's good feedback for the vision that you're, that you're offering, the big middle, this, uh, I don't know about that. Yeah, but this is battle-tested. We tried this in three different, uh, you know, places where the seas were rising, or whatever it is, and uh, you know, and it, it worked. It worked. It worked. So let's let's build that into our vision, and that's how practical we really are. So you that people want to write us off as being, you know, a high high. You have the chapters of that. I do, I, especially in Viking economics. In Viking okay, economics, yeah. I talk a lot about the successes that they had through we the strategy you're talking about. Great. Yeah. They also use a direct action campaign. Wow, I am just so impressed that so many of you are still here. You made some lot of uh, motivation in this room. Uh, wow, yes. Yes. Um, it, it seems to me I have no great knowledge of it, but the uh, uh, technology, internet, social media has a tremendous potential, probably already is uh, occurring, for either ill or good, I think. Uh, and, you know, I think for ill, I think we have, like I said, Cambridge Analytica gaining uh, neuroscientific uh, insight into us and influence, being able to influence the elections, which is a, which is huge, and just a, a, a dramatic positive thing. It was just I think it was yesterday in uh, 
in Thailand, an Arab girl, 18 years old, uh, through the use of Twitter, may have saved her life from being taken back to uh, Saudi Arabia. So, uh, anyways, I'm just wondering, you know, and then you think, you know, there's there are threats. I think the open media is one of the things, or the, the uh, putting a uh, stopping the open media and the internet service provider being able to uh, limit and kind of direct the content that you receive has already occurred in the U.S. I think. But I'm just wondering if you have any comments on the uh, dangers or benefits of technology. I don't. It's such a big subject. Yeah. And I, I'm just not. Mm -hmm. I just have studied it. It's a great question, though. I don't want to downplay the value of the question. I am thinking we should accept probably one more because I also would love to sign my book. You will be surprised to hear it. <laughs> and I know much of you have bought it, so. Last one? Okay. So, in your campaigns, where you've done like 125 actions, do you have sort of like a, a good general where you've got a number of fronts and you've got a number of different tactics and strategies going on? And have you done that where you sort of have different teams working on different strategies? Mm -hmm. and, and like, I think a lot of us, after four years, five years of, of certain campaigns are getting really burned out. So how 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 do you have a kind of quick response, multi uh, diverse tactics, and preventing burnout? Yeah, that's such a great question. How many of you have ever been tempted by burnout or feel a little bit, a little bit, a little bit a toasty? Yeah. Yeah, that's very real for me. I, I, I uh, took a year and a half to back up in uh, 19, uh, whatever that was, 89. <laughs> yeah, my friends went together and said, George, you look pretty crispy to us. <laughs> so we're taking up a collection and putting you, uh, putting you out to the country or whatever. <laughs> yeah, which was really great. Um, so I, I love the taking care of us. Now, the, the core team thing that I described earlier, that's a big, big help in group when you burn out. Another thing is the group culture that is so full of positivity. I noticed so many groups in Philadelphia after Trump was elected and then was doing all those really, you remember, those terrible things he used to do? Oh, he's still doing Okay, maybe he's still doing those. But anyway, uh, it was a shock early on. We didn't expect all those things, right? Uh, a lot of other groups were like discombobulated. Oh, my God, they became Trump obsessed and so on and so on. So on. Our group was just moving very long. And I think it was both because our goal was so clear, our campaign was so clear, and we had so much positivity in our group that we could say, yeah, Trump, now. So, uh, so we, you know, we had that momentum going. The other thing is the comparative, I mean, there's much more to be said, and, we, and I do say more in the book, but the other thing I'll just point out because of the Global Nonviolent Action Database, and that is that it is also a resource to us in terms of sustainability and not burning out. For example, on that bank campaign, as you said, 125 actions, five years, year three, we were starting to be on the floor. Most, most everybody was a newbie to activism, and it was like, oh, is this the eternal, you know, uh, am I gonna die doing this still 30 years from now? And so, um, so we, it was a serious morale problem. So we went to the Global Nonviolent Action Database, and we searched the term bank to look for campaigns with banks. We found that the students in UK declared a campaign to force Barclays Bank, which was up to its eyeballs in apartheid South Africa, to force Barclays out. <coughs> Brave students said, we're going to force Barclays out. 20 years later, Barclays left. Because they were up to there. 
and it took that long. So as soon as we found that out, we spread the word to earthquake prevention team people. Guess what? Barclays took the students 20 years. I was like, ah, 20 years? Well, this is only year three. That's nothing. <laughs> right? So perspective can matter, too. Just knowing not everything. And there are some campaigns in there that were one in two weeks. You know, so it's all over the line. But even knowing that there can be such variability and that it's not magic and it's not maybe uh, somebody highly idealistic in their first campaign, they think it's magic, and say not violence three times and whatever. <laughs> um, you know, and it's not like that. Okay, so so perspective is added by use of that. And that's why I'm so follow up. Sorry? It sounds like you don't take yourself serious and you use humor oh. and that's probably how you have survived and succeeded. Humor, absolutely. There's so much to crack up about. I mean, is this world weird or what? <laughs> What's really weird is that instead of closing this meeting so I could sign your books, I'm still laughing and joking. That's weird. George, stop it. So thanks very much, folks.